Welcome to Growing a Dental Practice. All you need to know to start, run and grow your dental practice. Each week, dental marketer Mike Hennon chats with doctors Lewis Butler and Sahil Tucker about their journey as principal dentists. Plus, interviews with prominent and upcoming figures in the world of dentistry and beyond. Now, here's your host, Mike Hennon. Hey guys, welcome back to the Growing a Dental Practice podcast. You are now listening to part two of the business plan episode. Enjoy the podcast. The following section is the practice and patient experience. So I guess this kind of ties into your whys and, and just, I guess, just helps, I guess it helps the, the bank or the lender understand what's going to make you different or why people are going to come to you, which is obviously useful to know. I think they look to see that it's been done, but I don't think they necessarily look to see that it's all positive stuff. So, for example, if Ryanair did this, the patient, ex- <laughs> the, 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 the customer experience, the banks will still lend to Ryanair. It's still a viable business. So I think it doesn't really matter what the content is. I think it's more that it ticks the boxes. So, for example, I mean, people can go onto our website and, and see our values and we've distilled them down. But, you know, there's an element of being environmentally friendly. I've talked a lot about digital technology. I've talked about client convenience. And this was actually something that the guy asked me in terms of online bookings and weekend opening, evening opening. And that will come to right at the end when we look at that competition analysis grid. We talked about transparency and honesty because I'm a very open and for my sins, a blunt person. So I say things how they are, but then taking photographs, taking scans, things like that will help. And that was part of the plan. Um, I've talked about community engagement, how we're going to grow the practice that way, uh, open days, teaming up with local businesses, that sort of stuff. And then I've also talked about value for money, which that's something that's important to me, as I alluded to. I, you know, my family wouldn't have been able to afford private dental care when I was younger, but that's quite important to me that we have stuff that is, you know, our checkups 50 quid, which if you've got the right priorities, it is, you know, affordable for most people. But our treatment costs are comparable to most of the private practices because, you know, at least if we can get people in the checkups we can do preventative stuff we can do cleanings things like that and make sure that there's a standard level of care there's a basic level of care that you know people achieve and then if they need treatment then then we will charge proper fees for that in the same section i've also talked about the unit i've chosen i think we've you know i said to you last time starting with why will lead to everything it'll lead to your workflows and sort of tie that into why you know when i was looking at these places and i said to the agent i've never set up a business before she was showing me the smallest unit there and i was like mm, i've kind of seen on your website that this one's available can we have a look at that i want to see the big one yeah exactly and it's not the biggest but it was the one that met yeah. my criteria i wanted to have a high yeah. ceiling i wanted to have that feeling of space i wanted to have that workflow where we've got a central decontamination a unit where all the doors lead off each other and you're not traipsing half the way across the practice there was a bigger unit opposite which wasn't too much more expensive but the ceiling was really low and there wasn't that element of space and that that was something that I knew what I wanted before I went there. And in spite of her showing me all the other things, I knew which one I was there for. And I've written that. Yeah, no, that's brilliant. Um, and that's always the, the patient journey. And like you say, the why, how that sort of led into the sort of unit you chose. You've, you've, I know you said you didn't have a, a proper marketing plan, but you have sort of touched on the marketing in, in this section as well. Yes. So... Uh, so... Yeah, exactly. These are more just bullet points rather than a step by step. And sometimes I just need things dumbed down for me um, and say, right, on this date, you need to do this. On this date, you need to do this. On this date, you need to do this. So I like having that sort of instruction. Um, But in this section of the plan, we talk about the practice and the patient experience. And uh, I've talked about how I want my patients to be greeted, how we're going to be environmentally friendly, how everyone's going to be photographed and scanned, how we're going to open with one surgery and then fit out the rest as we go along to keep the cost down initially. But we're going to make sure that, you know, every surgery fits out. We're going to have you know, the best chair. We're going to have 
TV on the ceiling. We're going to have a feature wall, all that kind of stuff. We're going to make sure that we've got a great website. Thanks, Mike. Um, <laughs> I've also talked about social media marketing will commence concurrently to the build, which is absolute rubbish. Um, <laughs> I, didn't, I never got around to that. You know, we talked about engaging local media, newspapers, magazines, that sort of stuff, online forums and things like that. And to be fair, I did post on a couple of the local Facebook groups and most people were dentist bashing, but that, that was fine. I think, I think we might have already had this conversation, but I'm going to go through it, touch on it very quickly. Before we opened, mm-hmm. maybe three, four weeks before we opened, I put a comment on four of the local Facebook groups. Now, each one of these has about 15, 20,000 people in them. So great, great reach. And I said, hey, we're setting up this practice. These are some of the things that, that I've thought about that people don't like about the dentist. And this is what I think, you know, we're going to do. Is there anything else? So I'd said, you know, people are nervous. and going to have an entertainment screen, that sort of thing. And I wasn't necessarily looking for people to tell me stuff. Because I felt like I'd discuss, you know, I discussed that with myself, with the business plan adequately um but it was more about starting a conversation because as you and i know if you've got a facebook thread the more that people like and comment the higher up it goes and the more people see it and all i wanted people to see was that we've opened a new practice yeah and most of the comments there were you know either good luck i would say about 15 percent. some of them were saying five percent was like this is so amazing as a dentist you're actually bothering to ask this the vast majority the comments there were well actually no 20 percent were maybe actual you know things say you know try this try this try this and I, then i think if my math is right that leaves me with about 60 percent when the comments were saying you know dentists should be nhs and they should do this and they earn too much money and all of this <laughs> but i was expecting that i wasn't i wasn't yeah. unprepared for that i just ignored it yeah or i yeah. engaged them to say hey you know one guy was saying i think you should uh, offer free treatment to the homeless and i'm just thinking that's great but do you know how much it costs to run a dental practice do you know yeah. before i even <laughs> open the doors of a dental practice i'm a thousand pounds down mm-hmm. and but you, you can't argue with stupid people right especially not on facebook because it goes from one to the other and then <laughs> you know they'll bring you down to their level yeah. and then it's just bad for your yeah image. i and think so, and so you've yeah. got to engage them in a positive manner and say, oh, look, you know, that's a really yeah. good idea. Can you tell me some more? Yeah. They tell you some mm-hmm. more. That's another comment. Your comments go, your, your thread's going up on that, on that, yeah. on that Facebook page. So it's, yeah. it's things like that where you're sort of making sure that you mm-hmm. get up those Facebook forums. And mm-hmm. from that, we've got our hygienist. So they, they found you on there, did they? they? The guy actually messaged me. He's like, this was only going to go one way. By the way, I'm a hygienist. Are you interested in hiring someone else? Like, oh, that's amazing. I'll just hey, Yeah. Well, this is it. This is the kind of person you want. Because some mm. people are going to react to that in, in quite a ballsy way. Mm-hmm. And think, well, actually, this person's a go-getter. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, great. And he's a great mm-hmm. hygienist. He's great. I can't mm-hmm. say a bad thing about him. And from that, we've also got patience. Yeah. Yeah. So it has had, you know, has had some positive impact. Well, it's, it's something that's quite remarkable, isn't it? It's going back to the purple cow book. You're going to do something that's different. No one's ever seen a dentist. You know, the most, most of the dentist posts in these Facebook groups are, my dentist is ripping me off. My dentist is charging me a band one fee for a checkup. Is that even right? Should I even be paying? Don't we have an age? There's that sense of entitlement. Uh, or I can't get in with a dentist or my dentist is charging me for PP. It's always negative things. This is something that's positive. And even when some people were saying something negative, I literally spent three, four hours on my Sunday morning. So I posted this on the Sunday morning because I knew I saw Googled and I knew that people are free on Sunday mornings. It's sort of built from built from there where it just get, went going up and up and up. And, you know, it's only as long as you react positively to even the negative comments, mm-hmm. it's only going to reflect well on you. And then obviously I've talked about you know, my recruitment policy in that section and how I'm going to hire people from. Yes, that's an interesting point you make there. Yeah, I, I don't believe in hiring uh, dental nurses as receptions. I think some people, some dental nurses are very much people, per, uh, people, people, people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, people, people—that's the word. Yeah, and they'll be very, yeah, they'll be, they'll be, they'll be personable, and they'll be, they'll be, uh, you know, great at reception. But I think the vast majority of people who have a clinical knowledge will always want to drown people in clinical knowledge because you don't understand the psychology of why people are asking questions and you know what they're actually asking. And this is um, so. I did a lot of uh, training with Ashley Latter, and this is one of the things that that he teaches 
is if a patient asks you for tooth whining, you don't give them a leaflet and you don't tell them it's about trays and you know you whine every night. You want you want to ask what their problem is so you, you can provide a solution. That's what a good salesperson does. If a person's come to you with tooth whining, and we know tooth whining is a, a prescription item and they're not qualified to prescribe it, and they're not qualified to make that diagnosis, we've got to first make that diagnosis as to what they're trying to improve. And so the correct answer to that would be along the lines of, oh, Mr. Smith, I can see you're unhappy with your smile. Uh, can I ask exactly what your concerns are? And we can sort of guide you to the best type of treatment or the best type of consultation because you know, we don't want to give you winding and find out it's not going to be the best option for you. Um, so tell us a little bit more. And event, you know, all of a sudden you've opened this door for people to talk about themselves, which people love doing. Um, and that's something that is lacking in dentistry, I feel, in all but the best practices. And I'll come to this with my competition grid. Um, <laughs> but also the whole thing, like if I were to liken what I want Dickens Yard Dental to be, in terms of another brand, I would liken it to Virgin Atlantic. Virgin Atlantic, if you Google tone of voice, Virgin Atlantic tone of voice, or Virgin tone of voice it might be, I'm not sure it's one of those two, they have a particular tone of voice about how to talk to people, about how to write to people, about saying, hey, instead of dear Mike, they say, hey, Mike. Mm -hmm. It's that sort of tone of voice that you've got, and I wanted to hire from service industries like hotels and airlines rather than medical backgrounds because all medical people will talk about dental people talk about the technical aspects of stuff and certainly you know we've had interviews today and that's you know we're looking to hire people from service and backgrounds and not not medical stuff it was very i was very specific and um, we had nurses in for interview as well it was very specific look you only be doing reception if we're very desperate otherwise you're clinical um, and of course i want them to be able to do each other's jobs in terms of i want nurses to do reception and be able to answer a call but i'd like my receptionist to be over and above and so that that was the idea behind that and going back to the businessman i just sort of summarize that into a paragraph and saying hey look this is what i want to do this is how i'm going to hire people this is where i'm going to hire them from i mentioned that i would hire trainees but only after a few months because I want to find my feet first and, and that sort yeah. of stuff. So that's where we are. Yeah, that's no, brilliant. It's a really, really good paragraph. Um, so that's the, what section was that? That was the, the practice experience, the patient experience. The following section is services. So you just talk about your focus is pretty much on general and cosmetic. Was there anything else that you wanted to include in that or just to cover the basics? Just cover your basics, but try and make sure that your services are complementary to what other practices are offering. So if local practices aren't offering implants, you need to offer implants. If local practices aren't offering sedation, you need to offer sedation. Um, it's about your USP and about differentiating yourself. And our USP is not dentistry. Our USP is a service. Because I'm not going to go out there and say my, de say my dentistry is greater than the professor down the road or the guy who's a specialist or the guy who's been practicing in 20 plus years. I don't do bad dentistry. I think my dentistry is good, but I wouldn't say, I'm not going to go out and say it's the best in the world. And, you know, that's not what we're competing on. Uh, we're competing on the way we do dentistry in terms of the service and also the experience we provide and the fact that all my materials are, are top notch and all that kind of stuff. But we're not competing on like the quality, if that makes sense, because I don't know other people's quality. It's the same way when Mercedes won't go out and say BMW's crap. Yeah. <laughs> They'll go out and say, hey, we're amazing. That's all. Yeah. yeah, sort of pick yourself up rather than playing your competitors down. Exactly, because you don't know. You don't know what no, the rest No, exactly. Exactly. But no, it's a very good section. You, you, know, you mentioned that implants will be uh, you know, something you offer that later down the line and you'll get a specialist into that or someone who does that to do that sort of side of things and you'll cover the restoration side of things and mention that you're training towards it so that's great um, and then you say you know eventually as you sort of learn more about your patients and as demand you know there's demand created then you'll you'll bring other specialists in or other dentists with specific skills that kind of thing absolutely yeah. perfect now we're getting into some of the so it's going to be quite a long episode so i may actually split this into two but that's cool. absolutely fine because this is really informative and I think people are going to get a lot of use out of this. So the next section is location. So this isn't just a case of, right, we're going to, we're located in Ealing. You've gone a lot deeper 
would you like to tell us to just explain what you were thinking or what you've talked about again? Okay, so the way that I chose the location was how big is the pond, I guess, is there scope to get patients without stealing patients of other people because that's quite difficult dental dental patients are quite loyal you're not really going to unless someone's really annoyed at the other dentist you're not really going to get new patients from other other dentists and if a patient is really annoyed at another dentist you really want to see that patient because who was being unreasonable there so there's got to be the pool's got to get bigger and healing is somewhere that's developing quite rapidly there's always been flats being built there and in fact Ealing was my local town centre in terms of where my school was. So my friends and I, we meet up, we go to Ealing or Harrow, but mostly Ealing. And we went uh, a couple of years ago, so 2019, spring 2019, we went to Ealing and I saw, hey, Dickens Yard is opening up. And I'd never seen it before. Apparently I'd been there for years, but I never really clocked it. And at that point, I'm in the frame of mind where... I think I've said in a previous episode where I'm looking to, you know, leave my practice and I don't know if I wanted to move to another job, or I want to buy a practice and that sort of stuff. And I'm looking at this place and I was just like, well, this is perfect because I know the area. And then I guess it's, you know, this section is more about justifying it to me and the bank than it is about anything else. So what's going for healing, Crossrail, more housing development, how close we are to the city, the general demographic trend where people are moving out of inner city areas because those are being bought up by, you know, shakes and the like. And, you know, families are actually moving out because Ealing's got relatively cheap prices. I mean, a one bedroom flat in the development that I'm in is over half a million pounds. So it's not particularly cheap, but there we are. Also looking at the adjacent restaurants and at this stage, you know, development's still only about 60% occupancy, I would say. But at that point, I had to sort of blag it a little bit and, you know, just trust that we had a good area. I was talking about all the restaurants, the bars and uh, the gym, the yoga studio. And we've got a soft play area, hairdressers, estate agents, just trying to, you know, big it up a little bit. But a lot of this information, a lot of this analysis you would get from... I think we should talk about negotiations and leases at some point, but a lot of this analysis you'll get from firstly the developer's own bump. If it's good for a FTSE 100 company, it's good enough for the bank. Uh, also, it will come from just general, so local publications. So for London, the Evening Standard is a good thing to look at. There are also local papers which give you an insight into what's going on in the local area. And you kind of want to use that for your own reassurance, but also just to tell the bank, hey, look, 1400 flats can't argue with that really and that's all i've written about and it's not just for me it's sorry it's not just for the bank it's also for me so that i know that i'm investing a lot of money and a lot of effort blood sweat and tears into something that should be on paper at least is viable so that's essentially the location analysis Mm -hmm. and then we move on to demographics yeah demographics (laughs) <laughs> I needed this because I read read this uh, on the American forums. This, this, this is a more American thing, then. It's not really a. Well, I, I don't. Um, maybe, or... maybe British dentists do this. I did this because yeah. I saw it on American forums. That's the first reason. And secondly, <laughs> because I saw it on business plans that were completely unrelated to the industry. So, I this part is completely off other things, but for, from my love of geeky stuff and bar charts and graphs and things like that, this hasn't <laughs> actually got. This hasn't actually got the bar chart or the graph attached to it, but you can get it off like Office of National Statistics website and things like that. Local populations, demographic, you know, what sort of age group you're looking at. So 40% of my local age group is 25 to 49, which is my target audience because I like doing a line bleach bond type dentistry, that sort of thing. Uh, It also shows that the average household income is 59, 60 grand. And at first it's higher than the local borough. So you can get loads of statistics online about local deprivation, about you have sort of like categories like A, B, C1, C2, stuff like that, where you've got semi-professional, you've got professional, you've got higher professional, higher manager, or that sort of thing. So I made reference to that where there are lots of um, managerial director, senior officials, professional sort of occupations in the wider borough to just show that it's more affluent. There's got to be something about it. But, um, you know, all these figures, if you look at the average wage in the UK and the average wage in the borough, yeah. I'm going to go out and say the average wage in the UK is about 30 grand, 31,400. And if the average mm-hmm. salary in the borough is, or household income in the borough is double that, then, you know, you're doing well. 
the and then I sort of summarised the end of that section about how our target market is this, and you know, going back to what I was saying a couple of minutes ago about family dentistry, aligned bleach and bond, that sort of stuff. So it's just tying it, tying it all in there. Yeah. So it just it just backs up that you know the, the type of dentistry you want to do, and obviously that type of dentistry typically is going to you know require someone with with more people with more money, and that just shows you again just it just means you're in just shows you're in the right place, isn't it? You're in the you've done the research, you're in the right place. The people that you're going to be located near and afford the service you're going to offer. So again, just ticking the boxes and um, reassuring the banks. Absolutely. But if I were to take a thorough approach, that's what I would do. If I were to take a wingy approach, just follow where MS food and Waitrose are. <laughs> you mentioned that before. It's great. Yeah, no, no. But if you think about it, as private dentists, we're not competing against NHS dentists. We are not selling a healthcare product or service service not products we're not selling a healthcare service we're selling a lifestyle service we're competing with gyms we're competing with travel agencies we're competing with hairdressers we're competing with to an extent bars and restaurants and things like that yes there is a healthcare element to it but the nhs in this country in spite of waiting lists offers adequate cover in my opinion maybe less so in the last few months uh, because of the pandemic but offers adequate cover for Essential dentistry. Essential dentistry, why do we have our teeth? Functionally, we don't need them. We can function without, we, we've got blenders, we can function without teeth. Is just to make sure, no, I'm being serious. No, no. <laughs> uh, but it's essentially to make sure that things aren't infected and we haven't got spreading infection mm -hmm. and things aren't hurting. So essential dentistry is literally just extractions and simple fillings. And that is offered adequately by the NHS on a uh, emergency basis if, if need be so we don't need it to maintain our health we choose to go to a private dentist over an nhs dentist because there is a certain you know experience associated with it and that's what we're selling we're we're giving people an experience which they might get in a high-end gym which they might get in a high-end hairdressers that sort of stuff because these are all lifestyle choices none of these are fundamentally health choices if yeah. that makes sense so yeah. that's something that's a really important thing that i feel that i need to understand and other people may have different takes on this bit of information but i would say that your your competition is not other dental practices you shouldn't be scared of the nhs practice down the road you should welcome it i guess because they're yeah. i think seth godin smallest viable audience you're not looking to treat everyone that's the nhs's job um, mm -hmm. you're looking to treat a small subset of patients who share the same values as you who appreciate what you do, the way you do it, and how you do it, because that's the you know that's the answer to stress-free dentistry, really, and just a stress-free life in general. And so that's what we're trying to provide. Perfect, love that. That's a great summary, and I think that's probably your third or fourth book mentioned. So um, I hope you get in commission. <laughs> no, I'm not. You know. <laughs> We'll set you up some affiliate links later. That'd be cool. Uh, yes, I right. need to do that because <laughs> on, on an aside, if I, when I'm doing oral hygiene advice, I will say to patients, you need to buy this and I'll show them on Amazon and Amazon will have an animation and then I'll just email them the Amazon link. Oh, we um, should sort it as an affiliate link for you, yeah. Well, this is the thing. I'm not sure how much money is actually involved in that, but, you know, every little oh, you know, if, if, if it all adds up to a coffee every week, that'd be perfect. Well, we've got a coffee <laughs> machine. Okay, well, you know. You know what I've got. You know what I meant by that. Yeah. <laughs> a, little, a little treat, right? No, so that's brilliant. Again, yeah, demographics is great. That's no, brilliant. Perfect. Final few sections. Well, actually, it's the final section, isn't it? And this is probably one of the oh, best. Is this the no, it's stop. not. No, it's not. No, yeah. no, it's not. Right, we've still got a few in. Right, okay. So the next section is competition. This is one of the best ones because you've gone out, you've looked at the competition, and I'm going to let you explain how you measured the competition or how you assess the competition because it's, it's you know it shows initiative so for me i was acutely aware that there are a lot of dental practices in the area and as much as this was a you know a dream i was playing devil's advocate in terms of is this really a viable business so i wanted to make sure that I would be able to offer something over and above what the adjacent practices would be able to offer. And to me, that was never going to be the dentistry itself because I, I have no way of measuring how other people's dentistry is and patients 
the way of measuring. They're going to want to know whether the experience was positive, whether they could get to see them in good time, and whether the dentistry actually worked, i.e. did the filling fall out. And I can be sure that my fillings aren't going to, going to fall out because I've been doing it for long enough. So that's that box ticked, and then it's getting the experience right. So I sort of thought about what criteria do I need to include in the analysis. So with regards to that, uh, distance is... It was just a way of sorting. So I've got a number of practices here. I don't think this is the full, this is not the full table. I've taken more of them out because there are so many. Well, oh, so many, so many practices or so many different so just, no, no, just, so just, many just different practices. So this table is a compressed version yeah. of the final table because gotcha. I was like, I don't want to scare yeah. that quest away. I was, want to show them on Faro, but I don't want to show them that there are yeah, too many practices. That's fair. This one. Okay, so this for just for listeners, just to recap, we're actually looking at it as part of the business plan is actually a table and it basically looks at uh, practice in, in the vicinity and we've got uh, headers for distance, opening hours, whether they're NHS or not, um, whether they're private or not, what service they offer, so whether it's a general orthodontics implants, that kind of thing, the the rough, the overall area they're in, and then so there's we can talk about this in a second, but yeah, you know, location comments and also just general comments. Um, so I think you were just talking about your distance, which is cool. Sure. So the only reason distance was there because so I needed a way to put these practices in a certain order. And that was literally mm -hmm. it. But obviously, it's good to know how far away this practice is from you. So if you imagine a table with maybe 10 rows or however many practices there are in the area, and then a table with maybe 10 columns, which is each of the criteria. So with regards to distance... I've explained that. With regards to opening hours, well, I think it's important to know where you're going to differentiate yourself. So I know I want it to be, uh, you know, we're, we're a service industry and we want to be available when people are out of work. So I wanted to make sure that I opened evenings and weekends, but I also wanted to make sure that not too many other people were doing that. And you can see from this, you know, a lot of people open Mondays to Fridays, a lot of people open nine to six, nine to five. Most people open Saturdays, half day. But a lot of it is very traditional, nine till five, nine till six dentistry, half day Saturday, and some of these people even close on Wednesday afternoons. There are a couple of practices who open late evenings until 8 p.m. And there are a couple of practices that open slightly earlier at 8 a.m. The late evening practices tend to be those targeted, and I don't know that this is on this particular spreadsheet that you're looking at or this particular table, but the late evening practices tend to be targeted at um, more sort of European clientele, so there are a few, there's, there's quite a large local Polish population and there are a couple of local, honestly, the website isn't Polish. So it's targeted at that level to the local Polish population, but I'm assuming that they've got a culture of you know, dentists working late um, in, in Poland. But it was just those practices. So I, I wrote out the opening hours, so it kind of gives me an idea of when I need to open because I need to do the exact opposite of what everyone else is doing or, or mm -hmm. you know, include that then nhs again this was i was still learning at this stage that you know nhs is not really my competition but i wanted to know what was available it turns out there's very little nhs provision in, in the area there's a few exempt contracts there are a few practices that restrict nhs times to, to just mid mornings so 11 a.m to 3 p.m which you know restricts a lot of working people then you've got practices with weights and then you've got practices who straight up NHS and who are just accepting patients at this moment in time. So this was back in 2019. Then we've got private practices. And what you'll notice is that most practices are solely private or they are very little NHS and then private on top. So they're mixed, but they're predominantly private. And what this says to me is it's fair game because these patients aren't going to these practices solely on cost because otherwise they'd be going to the NHS practices. If this area can sustain this many private practices, then there must be room for one more. I then looked at um, whether they offer GDP dentistry because uh, there are quite a few specialist practices in the area, a lot of which aren't actually on this um, table. So there are practices that do just, just orthodontics. But that's telling in itself because if there are so many private orthodontic practices, that means there are people paying for their kids to have braces, which means that they're affluent. And if they're you know, primarily specialist practices, well, these guys aren't competition for us because we're a general practice for now and we're going to take it from there. But you'll see that I've also written the number of dentists there. So I want to see how many things can this, how many dentists can this practice sustain? And most of these are just single handed dentists. 
working in practices. The relevance of that, I'm still not sure, but hey, there we are. Um, so then I've written about the specialty. So the main ones, ortho implant sedation, that sort of stuff, facial aesthetic, specialist endo, peri, that sort of thing. And you can see that everyone does ortho, everyone does implants. So it's not really remarkable if you offer that, even though that is kind of my bread and butter, the, the ortho side. Not very many practices offer sedation. And you've got to think about, firstly, do people need sedation? Mm -hmm. which I think there is a good need for it, but I think a lot of people just need reassurance and they don't need sedation. So then maybe you need to offer, and this was something that came up in that Facebook post. A lot of people were saying, have something for nervous patients, et cetera, et cetera. That's quite a big thing. So that said to me, actually, I need to be dental phobia certified, which I haven't done yet, which I will do at some stage now that I've thought about it. And then facial aesthetics. So a lot of practices are offering Botox. That's a new thing nowadays. Um, but, a lot of them are, a lot of them aren't, so that's something to offer. And then specialist, uh, specialist services, which I've mentioned earlier in my business plan, that's something I look to introduce. So I sort of looked at what people are offering. Mm -hmm. And then I've looked at the broad area. So within, within an area, you then have sort of sub-areas, if you like. So Ealing is just, you know, Ealing, and then you've got Ealing Broadway, and then you've got West Ealing, South Ealing, North Ealing, Hanwell, Acton, all of these areas that are local to us, uh, which are, you know, still within a mile or so, but... <laughs> It's all you know, because the population is so large, it's all sort of broken down even further. Uh, and that was more to say, well, actually, people who are in wet ceiling will really only go to their local dentist in West Ealing, sort of thing. It was just to get an idea of these guys aren't all in my backyard. Um, so these are all fairly mundane things, and now we get to the juicy bits, <laughs> uh, which are the comments. So I went out and I took a walk. I, I firstly Google Maps charted plotted all the dental practices and then I took a walk and location comments that was something it didn't start off this way but it was just general ideas about what, what these practices are like so location comments were on the basis of I found that some practices were in a basement or somewhere above shops outside Ealing Broadway tube station there are two practices two dental practices I guarantee no one will see them at first glance you'd have to look and look again and that's because they're above the shops and they've got a tiny little door between a KFC and a kebab shop or something like that which is where you go in so they're not a competition for me because you're never going to see them and I know I've got a massive window I mean they are a competition but I've got to sort of justify why they're not and then I went into the practices and to just inquire. And this was when you were able to just walk in willy nilly. And, you know, one of these practices had a buzzer, so you couldn't actually get in. Uh, one of these practices was located in like, like offices, if that makes sense. So it was like, a, you know, when you have an office suite with lots of little mini offices, it was like that. Yeah. Some of them had really nice high street locations. Some of them were in basements. Some of them were above shops. Uh, some of them were purely residential areas. Some of them were in residential areas where they barely had any signs. So you walk past it and you wouldn't mm -hmm. know it was a dentist because they had a tiny little plaque, that sort of thing, you know, the, the traditional gold plaque. Yeah. Um, so it was about saying, right, this is what they're doing wrong. This is what I'm going to do right. So I'm going to you know, really go out there and mm -hmm. put a massive window up and put a massive signage up in the window to say, hey, we're a dentist, come and see us. Mm -hmm. With regards to the other things we did, um, we called all the practices. So I called some and then I got bored of that. So I gave the phone to my mum and I said, look, these are all the practices, <laughs> call them up. And she said to me, why am I calling them up? And I just said, call them up. And she said, what do you want, to, what, what do you want me to ask? And mm -hmm. I said, just call them up and wing it pretend you want to be a patient there and it was just general comments on I, I explained to you earlier about how I wanted the demeanor of my front of house people to be so I'm not going to call them receptionists I'm going to call them concierges which we'll talk about the patient experience I think in a future episode but I wanted them to speak in a certain way and sound a certain way and engage people in a certain way and I wanted to know whether local practices are doing that because this is my one of my main differentiators I think I can do the service aspect the experience aspect better so you know for poor phone manner or abrupt or uninviting or you know the waiting room looks a little bit crap i even walked into people's toilets and that was a bit crap and you know that sort of stuff and what's not on this table what we subsequently did on the back of this was find out how much people are charging so we called and called and called again and we we then asked them you know how quickly can i see how juice how much does it cost and things like that and you know very quickly we built a picture about this practice is actually not very approachable at all. Okay. This practice charges this much, which means not that our pricing is influenced by other practices, but you also, 
you don't want to you want to be at the higher end or the lower end you don't want to be in the middle sort of thing in terms of pricing and we wanted to make sure that we were positioning ourselves correctly we didn't really want to associate our pricing structure with a price that was quite abrupt so that's how we did that and this- so in depth so in depth so good my favorite comment on here is this this comment here unable to locate now <laughs> honestly it was so frustrating it's above Starbucks. <laughs> Now that's like the worst. Like they, what are they doing then? But if they, they're just obviously so blind to it, aren't they? They've been so they're so used to to go into their practice and just I don't know, just just the word unable to locate your practice is just terrifying. <laughs> so in their defence, this is a this is a practice that's um, catering to very you know this is one of those practices that I was saying, excuse me I was saying to you earlier where they cater to you know their Polish or East European based practice. That's their target audience. Subsequently, what's not on the chart is that another practice opened up literally three minutes walk away from me. Could not find it. And yeah. again, it's targeted at that sort of audience where they're targeting a certain subset of the local community. Again, I think it's Polish. So I, I suppose their marketing is going to be word of mouth and not necessarily okay. just standard. It's very, yeah, very different. Yeah. So... But then for me, I've got to be thorough and say, are they competition? And I would say mm-hmm. no, because their patients are only really ever going to go to them because mm-hmm. they're getting a certain level of service that you know, perhaps they only get back home. So it was that reassurance. And again, you'll see that from the opening hours, that's a practice that opens from 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. Monday to Saturday mm-hmm. because stereotypes, Polish people work really hard and so they need to come in after hours. So I'm guessing mm-hmm. that's why that is. Um, yeah. I'm not knocking. Right. Knock, I'm not. I'm not knocking the Polish work ethic. I think it's quite inspiration, uh, inspirational, actually. So, yeah, yeah. It's only good. Th- you only say good things about it. So that's good, right? Yeah, so exactly. But then, no, this is so. This is a really, really thorough. It sort of, yeah, like we said, covers the the distance, but you only really use that from a kind of sort of sorting perspective. You know, you've managed to identify that most of the practices are open, sort of very traditional, very standard hours. Therefore, you can you can differentiate yourself, which is great. You can see that a lot of the practices in your area are fully private. So again, like you said, it kind of means that there is a demand for it. What harm is one more practice going to do, which is great. And then, yeah, just some 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 points around their, you know, the location, their visibility, signage, um, and then sort of some of the customer service, patient service perspective is really useful. So I'm not surprised that you've had banks say that, or people say that this is really thorough because that is very thorough and very impressive. So that's brilliant. Did you enjoy doing this or was it, did it eventually become a bit tedious? Yeah, no, I loved it. (laughs) You loved it. This is, this is my kind of stuff. I'm a details person. So I love this. I love doing the projections. We haven't even spoken about the projections yet. I don't think, you know, uh, we can, we can gloss over it briefly, but it's not really, my numbers are, uh, what you call it specific to me and they may not be relevant to other people so we can we can gloss over it very quickly in terms of what projections should include and, and things like that in a moment but uh, just looking at uh, the next page that we're scrolling down on which is a SWOT analysis so I kind of did this for Bant uh, because uh, <laughs> because I'd done it in the as part of my business studies business plan, uh, which was our sort of coursework assignment thing. And I also saw it online in terms of what goes in a business plan. That's you know, part of what I did. Yeah. And so a SWOT analysis of strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And for me, the strengths were high-end location, a lot of apartments, a lot of local businesses that are allied, um, large premises so I can create the premium feel, some very good negotiation by me. And... Um, <laughs> things like that and the weaknesses are it's brand new practice there's no re- reputation i've got a lack of experience in doing this so i think banks are good to know that you've got a lack of experience so kind of just put it out there and make sure that you've considered it and then mitigated it if that makes sense so we talked mm-hmm. about mentorship and things like that talked about threats so it's in london so and i'm renting i'm not owning so that's a threat obviously because that's a big chunk of my monthly outgoings uh we talked about the local practices so that's another threat there's a lot of them and then the opportunities we've got a lot of development going on in the area we've got the elizabeth line or crossrail coming there's there's a lack of nhs provision which means people have no choice there's a you know, affluent local population and obviously your strengths and your opportunities need to be the bigger boxes here because you're trying to big yourself up so it was just a quick summary of 
a quick summary of the business plan, I suppose. Yeah, it really has got a, a great sort of snapshot of everything we've just talked about in a grid view, like a yeah, full grid view, and it literally has everything there. So, yeah, I imagine when they got to the end of this, A, they were probably tired. Nah, I'm joking. They probably were like, right, this guy knows what he's talking about. He's now got a SWOT analysis. It's very obvious. It's basically a very obvious why it's a good idea to, I guess, lend him the money or lend you the money for this practice. You've been very thorough about it. Basically, what could go wrong, really? Yeah, it's short. <laughs> <laughs> so I think all bases covered a lot of it for my benefit, not the bank's benefit, in terms of <laughs> me reassuring myself because I'm the kind of person that always second guesses myself unless I feel like I've left no stone overturned. And this sort of gave me the confidence to say, right, I'm going to ditch a very good job a very well-paying job for something that's potentially going to be a lot of trouble. And I think going back to our previous episode, why I say start with why, because you can have some tough times ahead. I think this is, you know, this is part of the reassurance that you have, that you know you've got a viable business because you've done all the research and left no stone. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed part two of the business plan episode. Tune in next week for part three, all about projections. Thanks for listening to Growing a Dental Practice. For more insights, please subscribe and do leave us a review so that other people can find us. You can also find us on social media and on our website, growingadentalpractice.com.